Joshua chapter number 7 to start off with we're just going to read one verse verse number 1 but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan the son of Carmi the son of Zabdi the son of Zerah the tribe of Judah took of the accursed thing and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel now we know the story if you've been in church any amount of time you know the story here of Achan and we know the story that we're going to get into here a little bit as we'll read further on and but I want to what I want to preach on tonight is just the fact that we know we have some things as a church that are before us. We have Christ in the Caribbean that we have taken on, that our pastor is head over. We have a building program that we need to, uh, we need a new building, we need different things. So we, as a church, we have some things that we are facing in the future. And can I say this, I just want to preach with this thought in mind, don't be that one. Don't be that one. And see, because we look at Achan right here, and we get so caught up in the sin of taking the accursed thing. Yeah. Can I tell you tonight, it's not about you living in wicked sin. Right. It's just about if the fact that if you're not taking things serious as you could. If you're not looking at the fact of how serious it is of the building program or how serious it is even just as camp meeting coming up. Yeah. Not only just not taking it serious, you just think that it can't be done. Yeah. Our pastor alluded to, Brother Moore alluded to on Wednesday night of telling him things about the Caribbean and how God can't do certain things. Maybe you're sitting there tonight and you might think, well, I just, I don't think we can have that big in an effect. Sure. Well, then that would make you the one. Yeah. Not only not even not taking it serious or can't be done, maybe you're sitting there thinking, it's just not for me. It's not my burden. Pastor, you go ahead and you do whatever you need to do, and hey, I'm just along for the ride. Can I share with you three things right here? If, if you are to be that one and you're to be that hindrance, the reason you don't need to be is, number one, there are lives at stake. In verses 4 and 5, and I know we're comparing two different things, uh, that these people lost their lives, but can I say, if there are lost people that are going to die and go to hell, they are losing their lives just the same. In verse number 4, it says, So there went up thither the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. There are lives at stake tonight all around this world if we happen to be that one like Achan was here that keeps things from happening. Can I not only say there are lives at stake, can I say there's a chance if you are that one that somebody could lose it? In verses 6 through 10, And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord unto the evening tide, and he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And in verse number 7, And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we have been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall invite envi and us around and cut off our name from the earth and what will thou do unto thy great name can I say we have we have a, a pastor that has put his heart and soul into into the Christ for the Caribbean and into the building program and seeking out those things I can only speak here for myself you you study and you spend time and you think you have the message that God wants you to preach you go into jail maybe you come here and preach and it looks like half the people are asleep it's falling on deaf ears and no matter how much peace you might have about that message you go and think God did I miss it what what did I do wrong? What, what, where did I miss this at? What, what, what did, I, did I deliver it wrong? Was it the wrong thing? What was it? And you will begin to second guess yourself. Joshua's question, God, we could have just stayed on the other side. And now what's going to happen? Everybody hears about us turning around. And let me say this thirdly. Not only were their lives at stake, not only you take the chance that someone can lose it, but you also, you're going to lose in the end. Look with me down at verse number 24. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerai and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen, his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had, and they were brought into the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned, him, stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of the place was called the valley of Acre unto this day. You will lose in the end. Right. 
Right. You might not think so now, and you might not see it, but if you are that one, you happen to be that one, you will lose in the end. Right. Now, I alluded to this in the beginning. It's not about living in wicked sin. It's not about doing, uh, you know, like uh, uh, um, Achan did and taking the accursed thing. It's just, not, it's just about not doing what we're supposed to do. James chapter 4 and verse 17. Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him in his sin. Therefore, if you know that you need to, that God says for you to go and do something, go do it. Yeah. If you know that God tells you to pray, then pray. If God tells you to give money, time, whatever may be, your intelligence to something, just give it. If God tells you to encourage someone, just do it. Whatever it is, just don't be that one. Don't be that one that hindrances that can ruin and stop everything that we have before us. I'm finished, Pastor. Sir Hart, I tell you what, just a little bit of the background. We're going to go to uh, Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. First Samuel, I'm sorry, First Samuel. Everybody's familiar with this. But, I, you know, I picked up some few things I didn't realize. And as a matter of fact, it just, the Lord showed me something just a few moments ago. And I'm not, I wasn't taking it away from Brother Josh. It just, it just hit me. But anyway, um, verse 1, there was a certain man. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, there was a certain man from a man of Ramathame Sophim of Mount Ephraim. And his, his name was Elkanah, he was the son of jo jo Jeroram. Anyway, verse 2, he said he had two wives, and the name of the one was Hannah, and the other name was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Verse 3, and this man went up, out, up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts of Shiloh with two, um, and the two sons of Eli, Hopni and Phinehas, and the priests of the Lord were there. And there was a uh, and when the time was with Elkanah, he offered, he gave to Peninnah, his wife, and all uh, her sons and her daughter's portions. But Hannah, he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb because it wasn't time yet. I, that's what I wrote right next to my Bible. It wasn't time yet for her to have children. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. The thing about it, what I'm getting at is, why did it take so long for her to pray? Because it says right here, year after year after year. Her adversary, who's our adversary? The devil. The adversary during that time frame was still the devil. Yep. What the devil was doing was he was feeding Penina. Yeah. He was feeding her. Good. Constantly, day after day after day. Why did it take her, her so long mm. to get to an altar of prayer? Mm. Constantly, constantly. I'm going to have to speed this up. But her adversary constantly provoked her to soar. In other words, what that means is all the time, extremely. But it seemed like she only done it when it went to go sacrifice. It was to mess up her sacrifice. But Elkanah loved her. He gave her a good portion. He loved her. But, uh, but there's one positive. I just got this today. There's one positive about, the, about, about this. Her adversary drove her to her knees yeah. drove her to her knees and she finally got it because it wasn't for Penina she would never have got the blessing because here's what happened the, pro, the, pro, the prudence of her prayer she cared she went to in verse 10 it talks about how the bitterness of her soul she prayed unto the Lord and she wept sore God saw the tears that changes the whole outlook God sees those tears, said, that's my baby. That's my baby. The posture of her prayer, Hannah was so different than Peninnah. Yeah. Peninnah had an attitude. Oh, I've got children. That was the worst thing during that time frame you could lay to a woman during that, a Hebrew woman, because they were known by their children. How many children they had. But sure enough, her adversary just beat her up and chewed her up and spit her out. And this was laying hard on her. But anyway, 
the passion of her prayer. Hannah was so earnest in her prayer for her son. It's evident in her statement. She wept, bowed a vow. She spoke from her heart, poured out her soul before the Lord. It seems Christians just don't have time for that anymore. The persistence of her prayer. The scripture says she was continued in prayer. That's what you got to do because it says it right here. And it came to pass, she continued praying before the Lord. And they lay marked her mouth and they marked her mouth. It got to the point where she was just praying constantly, constantly. And Eli said, What's wrong with you, woman? Are you drunk? In the book of Acts, chapter 2, and verse 15, Peter, Peter made the comment. It is not time for, they're not drunk. They're full of the Holy Ghost. And then the promise of her prayer. Hannah put in an order for a man child and she got it. That's because she was consistent. She had passion in her prayer and she had the tears. And to make a long story short, our pastor always says, she left it at the altar. And that's what we have to do. We leave it at the altar. And God has sees your passion and your prayers. He loves you this evening. Bless the Lord. I'm done, Pastor. First Peter chapter number 1. Going to read one verse. <clears throat> verse number 24. Bible says, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Got a real simple thought tonight. Keep mowing your grass. But been thinking the past couple of days about grass. First thing about grass, well, in this chapter in context, Peter, first in this verse, he's quoting Isaiah, I think it's chapter number 40. Okay, you go back a little bit before that, he's also quoting other scripture. He says, hey, God expects you to be holy as he is holy. Right. Then we get down to here, verse after this, hallelujah, but the word of the Lord endures forever. He's saying, don't put your faith, don't put your trust in the flesh, in man, in people. But as I read, verse number 24, start thinking about grass. There's a reason it's important for you to keep your lawn mowed. First thing, grass is very fickle, and the only way to make it feasible is to keep it short. Name a sport where they use long grass to play on. You're not going to find it. Baseball, football, golf, tennis, all the grass is short. In fact, in golf, long grass is considered a hazard. It's meant to be a penalty to be in the long stuff. You won't be in the short stuff. You can't run around back and forth on long grass when you're playing tennis. Right? The outfielders in baseball, when the ball hits the grass, they expect it to pop up, not get tangled in it. Right. Right? And good luck running with the football when your feet keep getting ensnared by the long grass. Right. More important than that, even if you don't use it to enjoy activities on, the grass is meant to be framing for the house. Right? You buy a picture frame to make the picture just look a little bit more fancy. It doesn't replace the picture. It doesn't do anything more for the picture. Picture is still the picture. The frame is just the decoration. It's to show how important you think it is. Right? Well, the only way that God can use you as a Christian is if the grass in your life's short. Otherwise, you're going to get tripped up in it. But second, the grass... They got big fancy mowers that they got rollers on the back of them. They can put patterns in the grass. They can put, you know, cross sections in the grass. They can make the grass look however they want the grass to look. Well, what's that supposed to be? That's supposed to be the framing in your life that shows off what Christ put in the house. Does he not indwell you as a tabernacle through the Holy Ghost? Nobody cares about the grass as far as the value of the house. But if you care about the house, the grass is going to be well kept. It's only usable and it's only valuable when it's short, not when it's long. But then second, about grass, this verse talks about the flower of the grass being as the glory of man. Well, the glory of man can only bring about more man. The glory of the flesh can only bring about more fleshliness. They say Kentucky bluegrass, you get about five inches long, that's when it'll start sprouting flowers and then those flowers are seeds. If you keep grass short, it's not going to germinate. It's not going to make more of itself. Instead, it's going to stay exactly what it was. You let it get out of control, then you're going to have more problems than just the grass. You're going to have even more grass. Amen. Okay, the 
flower of the grass is what allows it to take over like, for lack of a better term, a wildfire. It'll spread if it gets long enough. If you keep it short enough, it'll never grow anymore. In order to get grass seed, you've got to let the grass grow. If you keep it short, it's not going to keep running crazy and wild in your life. Same is true of the flesh. We heard it this morning. If you crucify it daily, it don't have any room to grow to gain strength in your life. But then, not only the flower, not only the feasibility of grass, but I want you to notice the fire of grass. What's Canada going through right now? Wildfire. How'd that happen? A whole bunch of things grew up tall and then died off. And as a result of it, it had tender. You really want your life to be in the, neglect the glass, the grass long enough and it's going to catch fire and burn the house down. In fact, there are people that are nowhere near the fire, but yet they go outside and they're inhaling smoke. Why? Because somewhere along the line, grass got too long. But then, lastly, the framing of grass. Grass ought to be an indication of how much you love the Lord. Not what the Lord's done for you. Everybody's got grass. Nobody's impressed with grass. Amen. But you get a lot of Jesus in your life, the grass isn't going to grow as quick. You get a lot of heat, you get a lot of sunlight, the grass isn't going to get out of control. In fact, it'll start growing a little bit slower. You won't have to mow it as often. Right? The grass shows how much you care about what's inside the house. If you're in the right place, your grass is going to be trimmed. It's going to be edged. All the weeds are going to be pulled out. Why? Because you don't want no problems out of the grass. You want people to look at the house, not the grass. You let the grass get too long, people only see the grass. They'll look right past the house. So keep your lawns mowed. That's it, I'm done. In uh, Luke chapter number 10, and I've read this for 40-something years, and I'm still amazed at uh, part of it. In verse 30, it says, And Jesus answering uh, said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. And that is what I want to preach on, the other side. It always amazes me when I read this how little concern we are for people in the conditions that they're in. And why did these two men walk right by a person who's dying and didn't stop to help him. Right. Well, one of the reasons is their religion. Yeah. Because they're priests and Levites and they couldn't defile themselves with this dying man. Mm. And I know that sounds like legitimate for them, but for me I think that's horrible. Right. When you would let a man die right there in front of you and not help him. But you know, I see so much of that today, not only in church, but in life itself, how little we are concerned about people around us. It's not my problem. It's not my kid. It's not my grandkid. It's their kid. I would have liked to have some of you with me uh, when I would be on Main Street in Columbus at 4 o'clock in the morning and see people passed out at the bus stop. And you know, sometimes the part of me wants to say, look at that drunk. And God said, if it wasn't for me, that'd be you. And so we need to realize the only thing that's keeping us from being in the gutter is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not us. It's not because we're coming to church or even though it does help sustain us. You know, so why did these people go to the other side where, well, they went there because their rules wouldn't restrict them. It restricted them. The rules of being a Levite, to being a priest, they couldn't do anything. And I find that in church, they want to have prayer for somebody for two weeks and then let's vote to see if we can help somebody. And while they're doing all that, all these rules are allowing people to do without the stuff that they need. But the most important reason why people are going to the other side and not helping people is there's no responsibility. Amen. 
They don't want to stay over here where the dead people are because I don't have to be responsible. But I want to say to you, my friend, we are responsible. We may not put them in that. Now, I know that this man evidently probably knew that Jericho was cursed by God. He probably knew that. And he should not have went there. But that still does not allow us, because he made a mistake, does not let us make the same mistake by not helping them. And you know what we need? We need a compassion and a heart for people that are down and out. Yeah. I, I'm reminded, I see this lady very frequently uh, up in Hillsboro. Yeah, she's a black lady. And she stands right in the, in the middle of where I'm at and she talks to herself. Mm. And you say, she needs help. You better believe it. And you and I are the help. You cannot depend on our government. They need help. We're the ones that have the aid. We're the ones that have, have the ability. We're the one that has the Bible. We're the only hope this world has. Do you remember the story of Moses? Do you remember that how he killed that Egyptian and for 40 years he stayed and, the, and they prayed and asked God to help and God said, I will come down and deliver you? Who did he send? the guy that they didn't want to see. Yeah, right. We are that guy. We are that person. We are the one that needs to stay on this side where there is people that needs help. Oh, yeah. Amen. Seeing people, what would make a lady stand around and dozens of people and talk to herself? She needs help. Yeah, right. And you know, it'd be easy for me to say, you need to get out of the way. You need to go somewhere else. But you know what? It's only by the grace of God that that ain't me standing there. It's only by the grace of God that I'm not a heroin addict. It's only by the grace of God that I'm not a drunkard. It's not only by the grace of God that I'm not already in hell. See, I want to tell you something, friend. The other side is a place where you have to be responsible to nobody. But you are responsible. I'm responsible. Brother Doug, you're responsible. We as a church family, as people of God, we are responsible to those people outside of those doors to live a life that would bring God glory, that would cause them to want what we got. I say it's a sad day in America where you have to wear a shirt. What would Jesus do for people to think you're a child of God? Right, right. That, I, I ain't against all that, but I tell you what I think. Your light ought to shine to where they can say, there's something different about you. Right. On the other side. there It seems like a good place to go, but it's all we're doing is just walking away from our responsibility. You know what? I want to say this. I think the best thing that we can do, help everybody. You know, and I've been in church, Brother Doug, all my life. And you know what? The biggest thing I've always seen is, well, we can't spend money because they may not be legitimate. I get that. I do really get that. But let me say this to you. While you're doing that, there are people that li really, literally need our help. Right. There are people out there who don't have a decent car to drive. Right. There are people out there who barely make an ends meet. They don't have all the time in the world for a church to sit down with a deacon board and all these boards and make up rules and fi find out whether we want to help. We need to help. Hey. Everybody we can help. Hey. You know why? Because everybody in here, you're going to stand before God and I'm going to stand before God. And you know what God's going to say? Why didn't we do more? He's, God wants us to stay on this side and help everybody on that side. I'm done. Psalm 150. The final psalm of all the great book of psalms. Psalm 150 says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. And we can honestly look at this psalm and say it's filled with 
us being exhorted to praise the Lord. Can I say in the final three Psalms, 31 times from Psalms 148 to Psalms 150, we find the term where we're to praise the Lord. And I looked up what that word praise means. A lot of times we think we know what something means. The word praise means a commendation bestowed on one for his personal virtue or worthy actions. Means uh, 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 for his meritorious actions uh, themselves or anything valuable. Where uh, the praise means the expression of gratitude for personal favors confirmed, uh, a glorifying or extolling. It means the object, the grounds, or the reason to praise. It means to the to estimate or value, to boast in or glory in. And can I say that the word praise? The word price and the word prize all come from the very same root word. The root word totally in the Latin which we get our word extol from. It amazes me that in Christ uh, we have a prize. And in Christ he paid the price for us. And we ought to praise Christ uh, for all that he's done for us. Well in this psalm I just see some things uh, about praising God. First of all, we find in this psalm, the psalmist tells us uh, where we're to praise God. It says in verse number one, praise ye the Lord, uh, praise God in his sanctuary. Now listen, I know you can praise God anywhere, but if you don't praise him in his house, you won't praise him outside of his house. It's a good thing to learn how to practice praising the Lord uh, in his house, in the sanctuary. Uh, listen, we're amongst our kind. Uh, there ought to be liberty. Uh, uh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There ought to be liberty uh, for somebody to raise their hand. Uh, ought to be liberty for somebody to say amen. Uh, ought to be liberty for somebody to stand and say, I want to praise the Lord. Uh, he heard and answered prayer. Uh, I want to praise the Lord. He's been good to me. Uh, all the songs ought to praise the Lord. Uh, if the song don't praise the Lord, I don't need to hear it. Uh, 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 every part of the service uh, ought to be geared around giving attention uh, and glory uh, and honor unto the Lord, especially when we preach his word. Uh, we find where to, where to praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Can I say we also find in praising God the way to praise God. Uh, uh, we find in verse number one it says praise him in the firmament of his power. Now, if you read commentators, they will say this uh, is referring to the fact that uh, 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 his vastness of where he is and his abode is in the firmament of the heavens, uh, and they're to praise him in the heavens. Well, that's not what it's saying. How can we praise him in the heavens? We're on the earth. But the psalmist is telling us to praise him in the firmament of his power. That word firmament uh, deals with the whole expanse of his utmost vastness. And that means uh, by whatever means and whatever ability and whatever we can find uh, that will bring glory to him uh, with all our power, with all of our gumption, with everything we have, uh, we ought to use it to let people know how much we love him by praising him. Hmm? There are a lot of people who say, Brother Doug, why do you have to yell and holler and spit and scream when you preach? Well, that's the only way I know how to do it. That's what God gave me. Uh, but listen, I want to do it with all I got because he's worthy of it. Uh, so we see that the way to praise him is with all you got. Hmm? Huh? Hey, I've seen people say, I want to praise the Lord for Huh? I want to praise the Lord for saving me. What? I want to praise the Lord for saving me. Huh? Is that all you got? Or are you too bashful and ashamed to let people know why you're praising the Lord? Hmm? What's wrong with saying, I just want to praise the Lord for saving me? Hmm? In fact, if you said that, you can say it all. I mean, you've said it all. What we find also why we're to praise the Lord. Look at verse 10 number 2. We're to praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Who's greater than our God? Huh? 
Now, the Reds just caught up this young guy. He must be some kind of phenom, and everybody in this city is all turned upside down over a ball player. Huh? Do you still know he's got out more than he's got on? You know, the Lord's not a ball player, but if he was, he'd never get out. Can I say he's never even been challenged? Can I say because of his mighty acts, do you know God's the one that makes the sun to shine? God's the one that put the stars uh, in the heavens uh, to be as lights as night? Uh, do you know that God's the one that makes the lilies uh, and the roses uh, and the precious flowers we enjoy? Uh, do you know it's God that taught birds how to sing? Uh, it's God that uh, uh, causes uh, uh, nature to go on and do what nature does. Uh, it's God that made the beautiful rainbows uh, and it's God that made the beautiful canyons uh, and it's God uh, uh, that formed and fashioned men. Uh, hey, what a blessing to uh, have these babies in the service. Do you know that's a gift from God? Do uh, uh, you know man can't make something as precious as little Elizabeth? Uh, and look at her. She's paying better attention than a lot of you adults. Uh, she says, what in the world is that? Look at her. She's having a time. Uh, 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 listen, uh, uh, you and I uh, ought to look around and just see all that God's done uh, and then see what he's done for man. Uh, he gave his life on Calvary. Uh, hey, look at what garbage dump he found you in. Uh, every one of us ought to already be in hell, uh, but I'm not going to hell because uh, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me uh, and washed me from all sin. Uh, hey, uh, we ought to praise him for his excellent greatness, uh, for his mighty acts. Uh, only God can reach down from hell heaven uh, to, the, uh, to the gutter uh, and pull you up and pick you up out of that miry clay. Uh, set you on a rock. Uh, put praise in your mouth unto God. Uh, hey, establish your goings uh, and make a new creature out of you. Uh, who's as great as our God? He holds the waters of the earth in the palm of his hand. Who's as great as our God? He keeps it spinning on her on her axis. What a God we serve. He knows the intents and the thoughts of every one of our hearts. He knows the number of every one of the hairs on all of our heads. Uh, he knows uh, you're down sitting and you're uprising. Uh, God knows uh, even when you uh, in your mind and your heart aren't doing what you should do, and God loves you anyway. What a God we serve. Uh, that's why we ought to praise Him. Huh? We ought to praise Him because He didn't cross over on the other side. He came to where we were. Huh? Mm. I got a message, Brother Ron only preached it about once about 20 years ago on uh, what happened after he met the Samaritan. And well, after I met Jesus, my whole life changed. Huh? Can I say this? Uh, the psalmist also deals uh, with, uh, 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 with what we're to praise God with. In verses uh, uh, 3 through 5, he just mentions everything. He says, with the trumpet, with the psaltery, with the harp, with the timbrel, Dance, I know we're not supposed to dance as Baptists, uh, 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 with stringed instruments, with organs, uh, with loud cymbals and high cymbals. Uh, he's saying anything you can get, you can get a good sound out of it, you ought to use it to praise God with it. Uh, can I say that David danced before the Lord with all his might? If you go back and study that out, David offered up some nearly 8,000 sacrifices getting the ark back to Jerusalem. By the time he got there, he was so full of God, he had the can't help it, and he couldn't help it. He just was in another world. Uh, he wasn't dancing a fleshly dance. He was dancing because he was full of God. Can I say, I've been in some services where God just fall in the thing and folks get so full of God, uh, they might be running laps, they might be jumping up and down, they might be waving their hands, they might be shouting, leave them alone! Uh, they're praising God. Huh? Last year down at Brother Rocky's, Brother Phil took off, he ain't recovered yet. Uh, what can I say? I know some Baptists... You can only have a piano in the church. Well, not according to that verse. Huh? Huh? You see verse 4 where it says the timbrel? 
Uh, a lot of people uh, uh, associate that with a tambourine, but it's actually dealing with a drum. Can't have drums in the church. They associate with jungle music. I've heard them say that. Huh? Well, they was used it in Bible days. Hmm. Now listen, we don't have room on the platform. If we did, we might have some drums. Because Brother Brian's a great drummer, and he knows how to play them. He wouldn't play them where they'd be banging and loud, and everybody else, all you heard was drum. Because if we had them, I'd put a, a one of them glass things around where you couldn't hear the drum. We'd have to mic them, and we'd keep them under control. But you know why I would let him play him? Play him? Not because I, I wanted the, the scour of the brethren, because every preacher would come in here would break me over the coals. Because he has a talent. And he could use that for the glory of God. Huh? And I'd let him. Huh? You know why? Because he'd let me sit on the throne. I played drums a hundred years ago, and it's been a long time since I've been on the drum throne. Huh? But what I'm trying to say is, we've got so narrow-minded on what we can and cannot do, and who can and who cannot do it, or what. Bless God, somebody get full of the Holy Ghost and just praise God, is what I'm saying. Huh? Huh? Well, they can't sing. Do you know what they did? No, but I know what my sin did to Jesus. Huh? Too many of you are crossing over to the other side. I like that, Brother Ron. I'm probably going to steal that and put some meat on it and preach that somewhere, huh? But what he is saying in these verses is that anything you can get a hold of, that you can bring something out that sounds good unto God, use it to praise him. Huh? And by the way, some of the very ones say can't have drums in churches, they get soundtracks and they got drums on them. Somebody, somebody explain that to me, huh? Bunch of hypocrites anyway. <clears throat> Look at the final thought. Who's to praise God? Uh, can I say, the world's not going to praise Him. They curse Him. Look at verse number 6. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Why? Because God gave him the breath. But he makes it real personal. Praise ye the Lord. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You just get in on it. Praise the Lord. When we uh, uh, start the service, and, and we got a unique situation. I know we're a little unique. we got three different song leaders. we got Brother Clint, Brother Ray, my other Brother Clint. When they say turn in page number whatever, you ought to open that songbook up and you ought to sing from your toenails because you're praising the Lord. He inhabits the praise of His people. The more we praise Him, the more He just shows up and sits down amongst us. And I sure like it when God shows up in the service. But who's to praise the Lord? You are. If you're saved by the good grace of God, you've met all the qualification it is to praise the Lord. You know, I had a pastor tell me one time, he said, well, this, this person can't even say amen in the service. I thought, you're an idiot. Yeah. If God saved them, they can say amen in the service. Uh, what he was saying, Brother Ron, is somebody had been divorced couldn't say amen in the service. Uh, uh, listen, let me just say something. This might upset some people, but oh well. God was against divorce. But because of the hardness of man's heart and man continually pushing for it, God allowed Moses to write a bill of divorcement. God is still against divorce. God is for one man and one woman uh, uh, to be married until death don't part. That's the way of God. But it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, can I say sometimes uh, a saved person's married to a lost person, as long as the lost person's uh, pleased to dwell with them, uh, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, but there are some instances where a lost person says, I'm not going to be married to a saved person, uh, and leaves them. You can't make them stay married to you. Hmm? Can I say, uh, sometimes uh, there are people in a relationship uh, that are abusive. Uh, and listen, uh, no woman should ever have to put up with a man putting his hand on her. Uh, and can I say, sometimes the verbal abuse is worse than the physical abuse. Uh, nobody needs to put up with that. Are you listening? Uh, but can I say, uh, not everybody that gets divorced is sinful. There are some biblical reasons to divorce. But even if there is sin in the divorce, Brother Aaron, 
God's blood cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 9 is in the book and it's written to save people. Uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins uh, Hey, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, and if your sin is under the blood, uh, you have every right to praise the Lord as anybody else. My parents divorced when I was 13. I'm not for divorce. I told Miss Annette before we ever even got serious and we started even started talking about being married, I said, you better make sure because I've been through one divorce and I'm never going through another one. But can I say it's by the grace of God she has stayed with this old boy 34 years. I can tell you that right now. But listen, I do not throw off on people that's been divorced because I always know there's two sides to the story and I always know that throwing off against them and throwing darts at them, you're never going to help them. And as Brother Ron just preached, folks need help, and we need to minister to people where they're at, not where we hope that they should be. Are you listening? Huh? You know what I love about our church? We're the biggest bunch of misfits that I've ever seen. But God's still good to us, is He not? I just tell Brother Ray's daddy, because there was folks said we was a bunch of heathens. I told Brother Ray's daddy, I, I said, for a bunch of heathens, God sure is good to us around here. Huh? Huh? And, and, and I, it's a beauty and a blessing in our church. We don't care where you come from. We just want to get you to Jesus. And if you're walking with Jesus, we're glad for that too. Are you listening? But who's to praise the Lord? We are. I don't know why I got off on all that other stuff. Lord, have mercy. Not in there. It's not here. It's not in there. Huh? Let's see if that's in there. Uh, is that in there? Okay, thank you. Somebody just need to hear it. Probably Charlie right there. Somebody need to hear all that. Huh? But truth of the matter is, we need to praise the Lord. Amen. And the church house is a good place to get practiced up. So that... When we get out there, we don't cross the other side. We try to look at people the way Jesus looks at them. And when problems come our life, Brother Phil, we don't wait so long and try and deal with them with ourselves. We've seen too many people get help at the house of God. We just come and bring them to Jesus. And when we realize when we're coming to the house of God that we need to be in a position to praise Him, we keep our lawns mowed. We keep our flesh under subjection. Huh? Are you listening? And we certainly don't want to be the one not in tune with God. Because there's nothing worse than coming to the house of God and being out of tune. And everybody else getting blessed and praising God and we're sitting there like a knot on a log. I don't want to be that person. I just want to bless and praise the Lord. He's been so good to us. Yes. He is worthy of our praise. And we ought to bless Him with our lips and with our lives. Because there's too many people out there looking for something that's real. I told Miss Annette this. I got a little vexed. I got a little vexed when I heard that this weekend was the 50th anniversary of Pride weekend in Cincinnati that's not true brother Josh I've been around 59 years you can't go much past 5 or 6 years ago you didn't see big old parades and all that in Cincinnati trust me I've been around I remember when, when there was an uproar in this community over an art exhibit called Maplethorpe uh, so that's not true now there might have been a couple people in a basement somewhere having a parade but it wasn't in Cincinnati. But this is where I got vexed. How come we don't get a bunch of churches and a bunch of believers have a parade? Do you know, just last week, Dodger Stadium was having a big thing when the Dodgers was playing about pride. And they said there was more Christians showed up in protest to proclaim the goodness of Jesus than there was inside the stadium. 
How come there's not more of that? Why can't we get a bunch of Christians? I don't even care if they're Baptists. Why can't we get a bunch of Christians together some Saturday and march the streets of Cincinnati praising the Lord and proclaiming how great Jesus is? Huh? Hey, if they can have their parades, why can't we have one of ours? We throw off all the time on Christians don't have any rights. We do. We just don't take the rights that are afforded us. You know why they're on the news? Because they exercise their rights. Shame on us. God help us. Brother Ed Wilson, you organize that. Call every church in Cincinnati and say, we're going to have a parade. Go get a permit. We'll go do it. Huh? Wouldn't it be a blessing that they'd have to report? Look at all the Christians that showed up and everything was peaceful and everything was wonderful. And while they were marching in parade, they took bottles of water and gave to homeless people. They took gift cards and gave gift cards of food to homeless people. And gave them gospel tracts and said, Jesus can change your life. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Hmm? Well, somebody that's not as busy as I need to organize that. And let's just do it. Because Jesus is worthy to be praised. But if you don't praise him here, you'll never march the street and praise him out there. God help us to praise the Lord. I'm done. You know what? I just don't feel led to give an invitation tonight. If you need to come and nail something at the altar, the altar be open. But I would like to take a little time to fellowship. We've heard some good messages that ought to inspire us to be the best church we can be. And that starts with showing one another how much we care about one another. So, Miss Renee, if I could uh, trouble you to come and play some We've heard some tag team preaching. It's time to fellowship kind of music. And part of putting all this in practice is we need to learn how to appreciate one another. We need to let one another know we care about one another. We need to let one another know we're here for you if you're going through something. So... For the next few minutes, can we just, more than just running by somebody and shaking their hand, can we just be real sensitive to go to people and let them know we really care about them? And just be good to one another, because I promise you come tomorrow, you get out in this world, they ain't going to be good to you. And there may be somebody here tonight that's really burdened, and you just speaking a kind word to them might really impact them in their life. So let's just stand and go and be good to one another and mind the Lord and no telling how God can use this to impact people's lives. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.